my research has for many years been on the environmental impact of livestock production, and uh, <coughs> that's why I focus on, focus on this in this little talk I will give you. And why is this very important? That is because livestock, livestock, feeding livestock actually takes up so much of all global agricultural land. Actually, almost three-thirds three of all agricultural land is used for livestock production, including all this permanent pasture of around 2,800 million hectares, and about one-third of the uh, croplands producing arable crops. So if we are going to talk about agriculture and carbon, we must talk about uh, uh, livestock. <coughs> During the last five years, there have been a lot of research and publication on greenhouse gas emission from livestock products. And one example here is for milk, where you have produced a number of carbon footprint of milk. And this is actually the life cycle greenhouse gas emissions of of all the greenhouse gases coming in the different steps, and this would be milk in Sweden or Denmark. And you can see here that we have a focus on agriculture, primary production, and we also have methane and nitrous oxide, not, not fossil carbon dioxide. In these carbon footprints, so far, carbon emissions or carbon sequestration in soils are not included, and that is because we lack reliable data. Another example is um, the FO, and they are working on a global scale, looking at the carbon footprint of livestock products for whole, all the world for different regions. And this is for milk production. This is the global milk production and its emission of uh, uh, greenhouse gases. It's about 2,000 million tons of carbon dioxide equivalents. And the total greenhouse emissions are around 49 to 50 million tons. So it's about 4% of all greenhouse gas emissions in the world. And we can see that we provide with milk and also with some meat because we have ca calves and, and cowed cows coming out. Also, these emissions given by the FO do not include anything on soil carbon sequestration or emissions. Uh, this is the prediction of the agricultural greenhouse gas emissions, and they don't look so good, actually, if we want to think that we are have to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Here you have the total, and here you have the uh, distributed for developing and developed countries. And first we can see in the total that no matter where in the world we are, it's the uh, CA, uh, methane from enteric fermentation and soils NGO that is the most important. But we will see that the pr prognosis is for a growth of emissions of around 14%. And especially in the developing countries, which is due to a growing population and also eating more uh, livestock products. Again, this is not including any emission from soil carbon or soil carbon sequestration. In the last report from the IPCC, there was a big chapter trying to see how, what type of potential are there for taking down greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture. And this is the result. And the very interesting thing here is that if you look at all these blue staple, that is carbon dioxide, and it's actually soil sea sequestration. So there is a very, very big hope that soil sea sequestration should be a lot of the mitigation potential for agriculture. And we can just look at this largest one here. This is cropland management and grassland management. I will come back to these two later. But here we have management of organic soils. And in total, it would be as much as maybe 1.5, 1,500 million tons CO2. And these are not so large areas, but if you take those uh, areas out of production, you could have a lot, uh, be avoided a lot of emissions. And also restoration of degraded soils, quite a large staple here also. But still quite surprising that we have so much faith in the soil carbon sequestration in the, what IPCC said in their latest report. So, since this seems to be so important, we should have some basic on soil carbon sequestration because there are some concepts here that are of big, big interest. 
This is a soil, an arable soil, cropland soil, and we have a carbon storage and say that it holds about 50 tons of carbon per hectare. And we say what, that we have a soil at equilibrium. Then we do something, a measure. For example, we convert this cropland into a perennial crop, a grassland, and we will start to have a input of carbon in the humus fraction, so it's stable carbon. And this is what we call soil carbon sequestration. And after a number of years, we will reach a new equilibrium, so we will have a saturation. And this time frame can be 10 years or it can be 100 years. Depends on soil, depends on climate. Um, and it's typically faster in a warmer climate than in colder climate. And then we have another important, and that's carbon sink permanence. How long will this carbon sink actually last? And that depends on the land use afterwards here, because we have to continue with this land use to actually hold this carbon in the soil. If we start to plow after 50 years, then a lot of the carbon very quickly can go up to the atmosphere again. So important things here when it comes to carbon sequestration is actually what type of carbon stock did I have in my soil? What, did I have a high carbon stock, already a saturated soil, or a degraded soil? And also the input of carbon. How much carbon do I give the soil by residues or by organic matter so I have some stock to build on? <laughs> and then there are all these biological things like temperature, clay content, and water content. And just to show you the importance of how much yield do I get, but for the important thing is that if you have a high yielding crop, you have more residues in roots, so you leave more organic matter to the soil. And just to show you, here we have winter wheat, which is a standard crop in Western Europe, 7 ton per hectare, and barley, 5 ton per hectare, two different types of grain. This is what you take away with the harvest, and this is what you leave behind for the soil. And here we have grassland making silage, and generally all these grassland products, they give more residues under in, in roots because they have a much longer vegetation and they have a bigger potential to build up the carbon in the soil. So, I think that this 90% mitigation potential is quite uh, overestimated. And sometimes you have to, you, it's easier to talk about them, but you have to know about this limitation. And that is that you do have sink saturation. We can't go on forever doing this. And also that you have to, if you have achieved a carbon sequestration, then you have to go on with the land use. And then there is an important effect that has been a bit criticized in some papers how, how IPCC have calculated. And they say that you haven't thought about the displacement effects. For example, as I said, organic soil or peatlands, where you have the potential, if you don't use them anymore, you will, have, you will save a lot of emissions of CO2. However, there might be livelihood, production of food, and where will that production go? That might go to grassland, which you have to plow, or to deforesting new areas. So these displacement effects should be better considered. And also there is this problem with monitoring. Um, there are very large variations, both in grassland, even more in grassland, grazed grassland, on carbon stocks. So if you are going to verify how much carbon are built up in the soil, you need a lot of uh, soil sampling, which is expensive. So we have to work with models, and models have to have good input data. And this thing is quite tricky, and there are still a lot of work to do on this part concerning soil modeling. So just ending up with about different feed production. Now, monogastric animal, this is pigs, as you see, <laughs> also chicken and poultry. Um, they are typically eating grain for energy, and then they have a protein source, which is soy meal or rapeseed meal. That's basically 
the main thing how we produce chicken, eggs and the pigs in the world. And I know that th th there is a focus here on developing countries, but there are still, still if you look at the statistics from FO, there are still what they call backyards pig or chickens, which eat uh, like leftovers or starver. It's still a very, very small fraction of the total production of, of meat in the world, and it's, 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 it's being reduced, and in future, when we're eating more meat, this will actually be the main how you feed these animals. That means that these animals eat crops from, from the uh, cropland, so like grains or, or soybeans. And uh, if we look at this IPCC, um, um, giving uh, in this chapter to look at what potential are there for increasing seed sequestration, there are a number of agronomy practices to give higher yields, because higher yields give higher crop residues, and there is a bigger potential for, for working out the carbon in the soil. Um, the one thing I can say here is that when we look at the feed for these monogastric animals, it's annual crops like grains and beans. And one thing here is when we talk about extending crop rotations as a good agronomy practice with perennial crops, I find it a bit difficult here to find what type of perennial crops would be good to feed the monogastric animals. So uh, that's just a question sign I have. Improving nutrient management, that's absolutely something that is uh, going to be good because uh, it will save nitrous oxide, but it will also probably give better yields, especially in developing countries. This no tillage has been talked a lot about, and the theory is that if you don't plow or harrow so much, you have a, a, a soil that you don't move around, you will have less emissions of carbon. However, just the latest one or two years, there are several papers questioning this theory. And when they look at all the field air experiments that has been behind this, they have actually just looked at the soil pro profile to 20, 25 centimeters. But if you go further down, there is a tendency that when you plow and till a lot, the carbon actually distributes more in the soil profile. So you still have the same amount of carbon, but it's dis distributed differently. So I think that this is quite a lot of discuss discussion, and I think that this has been probably overestimated. Agroforestry on co cropland, this is the same number here and here. And the basis for this one is what I say in agroforestry, we don't till, so we don't have uh, this disturbance of and going off on carbon dioxide. So it might, might be a question mark here. And the reason why they don't take up the carbon in the trees is because th they believe that the trees will be used so the carbon will be emitted. It must be sequestrated. And the big thing here is actually when you do a land cover change, turning cropland into native vegetation or to grassland, and then we have su substantially higher potential for carbon sequestration. Now ruminants, um, this is typically how it's done in the Western world, and in, in developing countries it's much more pasture and grasslands. But the one important thing here is that the di digestibility of feed is extremely important for reducing the methane emission from enteric fermentation and also from the production of beef and milk in developing countries. And you can actually do that by grassland very well if you have a good grassland management. And this is just uh, looking through. We have done just a report and we have looked at the different ref references on what, how much carbon sequestration, different type of management can have. And there are a lot of things you can do here. Conversion of cropland to pasture or to grass. Generally, pasture is better than grass for, for building up carbon. You can have fertilizing, but not too much. Uh, you can have a good, um, a higher plant diversity seem to be positive for building up carbon sequestration. The problem with this one is that, that when you look at the literature, you sometimes, very often, it's not so the time frame. Is it for five years, 10 years, or 20 years? These numbers can be used. How many minutes? Three? Yeah, okay, not two and a half. Uh, so 
I would say that milk and beef is very in interesting because you can produce them with that very different types of feed rations. And this is just an ending up an example, what we are doing in a research project now with a colleague, where we look at milk production using different types of feed rations, where the green part here is grassland feed, the yellow one is um, grain, concentrates, and ha here is maize. And here we are looking at a feed alternative where we actually use a very high quality grass, which can replace both grain and some concentrate. And that will mean that we can grow more grassland instead of one year crop. And the prelim preliminary uh, results from this is that when we calculate with modeling these soil carbon s s changes, they are significant, they are absolutely important. But still, if we look at the whole carbon footprint of the milk, they are not in any way reducing like 50%. <laughs> so you could say, I can drink a lot of milk because I have soil carbon sequestration. That is not possible, actually, because there are so many other emissions. And just to say one thing, that um, when we talk about carbon sequestration, we still have a lot of question signs around grassland, how, they, how much carbon they actually put into the into the roots and give to the soil. There are still, you know, scientific measurements that has to be needed. So this landscape carbon approach, I, as you hear, I work a lot with production and to look at different. And we are, in my line, we are looking at system analysis of our production system. And there are more and more interest of looking at landscape level and regional levels now. For example, in Europe, mixing farming with animal farming and crops much more together. There are projects going on, so I would say that this landscape focus is important also in developed. But I still see that we are needing more knowledge and understanding, both on fluxes and stocks. So there are still some basic research that has to be done. If you look at system analysis, and by this I mean I have a production system with food, I have positive and negative effects of that one. And we n typically do this for a product or a farm level. And when we upscale this to a landscape level, there are some methodology uh, difficulties that I think is quite dif important to discuss. And also interaction effects of crops and maybe forestry in future. And uh, I must say this one risk for the placement effect that you, if you are given in a landscape, it's very easy to say, okay, we have some organic soil, we take them out of production, uh, we, we put this cropland into uh, uh, extensive grassland and we will have carbon sick, but we will maybe lose production. Where will that production go? Because we still have to produce food. So my final question is that I think it would be interesting to discuss uh, the type of methods and tools that we need when we are looking at landscape in the, in the environmental impact from a landscape with all this production, and what tools do we need, and how much do we need to look outside this given landscape, not to risk that we do some uh, displacement effects or what some call carbon leakage. Thank you. Uh, rich information we're digesting. Seventy <laughs> um, percent uh, digestibility. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> yeah. Okay, the mic. Uh, so, please, some some uh, questions. I see people waving. Okay. First of all, I think that one more point that has to be taken up when we discuss this carbon sequestration in the soil is that we bind in nitrogen in the soil. Yeah. That means that we need to have um, more nitrogen in the fertilizer. And secondly, we are building up with time a nitrogen bomb. Mm. And there has been central models mm. looking at the N2O, seeing that once you reach this steady state, you have a steady state of N2O emissions, which you can't mitigate, which means that you get a higher emission of greenhouse gases in the long run. So one could put a question whether it really is good to build yeah. this up if yeah. you can't get it stable. Let's take another mm -hmm. a few more questions. Uh, 
present just your name. Yeah, my name is Johan Odling from the Department of Biology and Environmental Research. I appreciate your, your uh, critical attitude to the soil organic sequestration expectations. I could just add that I, I work more with, with trees and forests. And there, there were also large ex expectations of, of forests sequestering more carbon in the soil under rising carbon dioxide. But the long-term field experiments that have now been conducted for more than a decade, they, they show that there is no such effect. It's just a faster turnover. Yeah. So there could actually not be at all a new steady state with more carbon. The steady state could be nothing. <laughs> yeah. Is there a question? Or no, I, the question was to Leif and Onawasa, really, I, how much they believe in this, but these expectations. Not, yeah. Please, please <laughs> please <laughs> so he'll okay. That in yeah. Already yeah. Presentation. Good. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to raise uh, uh, some sort of a, um, accounting pr aspect to this that uh, when we account for our carbon, we usually do it by the producer of carbon, of greenhouse gases. Mm -hmm. While we are hunting all the time the driver, which is usually consumption. the consumption. Yeah. So do you have anything, do you see mm -hmm. any openings that maybe yeah. we're, we're actually trapped in a system that will never be able to, for example, take up the displacement effect? No. Let's give the floor to yeah. Chris. Yeah. Yeah, I, t I totally agree with, with Leif here on the ni nitrogen question because there is this, you can't talk carbon without talking nitrogen in soil because they are so closely uh, together. Uh, and, and, you know, if you raise, if you get CO2 higher, you get the, I mean, there are positive things because you get more humus, you get better, it's better for the soil, better water capa capacity, etc. But there's also a higher nitrogen potential and mineralization. And what I think is very important, and what I don't see in, in, in practical agriculture so much, is that there are still not enough knowledge in how you fertilize to take, to take um, care of that uh, nitrogen mineralization. There is a tendency that you don't think so much about it and you add your fertilizer. So you have to adapt your whole system if you are having this rich soil <laughs> in, in both carbon and nitrogen, and maybe it doesn't really be enough. But still, there, c there are potential, but there are also positive. I, I agree that nitrous oxide emission is a negative, but there are also positive things of havi having a high carbon dioxide, so, sorry, high carbon content in soil, for example, for holding water. And when it comes to production, the carbon accounting, we are calculating the production emissions, and when it comes, which we will <laughs> talk about at our department, if we look at the needs to reduce greenhouse gas emission, they are almost impossible in, in agriculture and food production because methane and nitrous oxide, we don't have any, we don't have any actual technical things to say we can reduce this by 80%. There are no ones today. So I think when we come to agricultural and feed production, food production products, maybe we have to have to start to talk about what shall we consume in the future. And then we must discuss meat and milk because they are such a big part of the emissions and of the land use. Thank you. 